Future Scanning, Architecture and Design by Cameron and Shannon. The areas of residential architecture are as stated, painted caves from 25,000 BC, mammoth bone huts, 16,000 BC, hide tent, 11,000 BC, mud brick, 8,000 BC, domus, 500 BC, timber frame, 1st century, chateau, 3rd century, mud hoof, 9th century. As continues, in the 10th century, caravansari, 11th, cob houses, in the 12th century is Gothic, 16th century went to Colonial, into the 17th, which is Minka, on to the 18th century, which is Box Arts, and then to the 19th century, Victorian, and then as well in the 19th century was Craftsman. As we begin, painted caves from the 25,000 BC. The materials used was discovering a cave without any animals lurking within it. So any cave you found was yours for the taking. It also needed to be near a river access and have firewood nearby. The only thing suitable about this home is that no materials were needed to build it. But the only downfall is there's no enclosed entrance or insulation besides a fire or wool. The Mammoth Bone Hut of the 16,000 BC. These were interesting because they were just covered with animal fur and bones from larger animals that were slain. The fur was a mechanism for keeping some bit of warmth, as it was common to be wearing the fur if it wasn't on your hut. Bonfires were built right outside the entrance, allowing heat to be funneled in and trapped inside. So this was, you know, this was great innovation due to moving from a cave where it's nothing but hard rock, cold, to now you've got some fur insulation, enough to try and keep you a little more warm. Mud brick houses, 8000 BC. Mud brick homes are pretty much what they sound like. Bricks made of mud, often made on site from soil provided. When building mud bricks, require a sturdy footing that can withstand weight and provide a sturdy, relatively flat surface. The brick itself is generally soft, so the use of hand tools would suffice. It's the equivalent to brick and mortar structures built today, or if you work any landscaping business, it's usually called mud. The construction of these mud room rocks, mud, <laughs> the construction of these mud rock homes are low cost and low energy, especially since the home is built on site with the ability to store and release sizable amount of heat. Only downfall is that these homes can be easily damaged due to rain, wind, if not protected right. But all in all, these homes were made from natural materials, making them suitable, sustainable, recyclable, non-toxic, and healthy. And the soil that you mash together is mixed with water, and then straw and cemented are pressed into wooden frames to set over periods of time. Domus, 500 BC. Often owned by the wealthy and found in most major cities of Rome, hence why they're usually found usually fountains in the center of the homes or in the atrium. Domus homes include multiple rooms, indoor courtyards, gardens, and decorated walls with paintings and sculptures. When building these homes is typically sectioned into 16 areas, with there being two focal points of either an atrium slash open roof concept. And the open roof concept is where they've got two diagonal roofs, wherever the open roof is, there's two diagonal roofs flowing into the area and it lands into the atrium as shown in the picture. And that's what gives it that fountain elegant look. So this is why these are the focal points of the houses. The domus domestic is the English word, which stems from the Latin word domesticas, which comes from the word domus. So dom meaning home seemed like it would be the best way to call these beautiful, elegant houses for the wealthy. Timber frames of the first century. Very sustainable due to an abundance in forestry and global warming wasn't as prominent as an issue as it was nowadays. So cutting down wood, it would just seem like there was an abundance of it. It's considered green, eco-friendly, and requires less energy and produces less material waste in the building process. As well as timber frame has the lowest cost of CO2 of any available building material. So it just seemed like it worked out perfectly. 
Converting timber into usable building materials takes far less energy and creates minimal pollution compared to other mainstream alternatives such as aluminum, steel, concrete, and brick. Chateaus of the third century. The residents were royal families or noble families on countryside houses. The building style resembles that of castles, but the architect was just inspired by tall, thick walls with small windows, and a lot of them. The mud heaps of the 9th century. Built to match the topography and handle the climate. Bundles of reed bent into parabolic arches and woven within the sides of these homes made it very sturdy but due to the land that it was built on. And it was really readily available because of it's just a bunch of reeds around the area. Small openings let in controlled daylight and maintain the air because the breeze can get really strong. So with it being sturdy, it also needs to be malleable and somewhat enough to where it's not going to fall over. So with these small holes, it helps control how much air you're letting in and out without it blowing the house over. And it also controls the light. The car of Ansari of the 10th century. Originally built by a warehouse to be a warehouse and a camel caravan stop overnight. Built to surround the courtyard with structural solid walls and considerable size. Sustainability is along the lines of economic, social, and environmental, such as repurposing the home to accommodate the needs of the situation due to its size. So, say you had a political run or it was a big wedding or so. A lot of these houses were converted for these events because of their size and the sense of comfort and protection due to the way it was structured and it could just hold a lot of people. Therefore, that's why they have camels in there. If you can see behind the circle, you've got camels drinking out of the water in the center of the building. Cobb houses of the 11th century. These cob houses were made from raw earth materials such as cob, bricks covered in straw, and on-site soil. Instead of creating uniform blocks to build with, cob is normally applied by hand in large clumps, hence where the name cob was derived from, passed from person to person in the process of forming the building. Insulation is, is uh is prestigious which leads to downfall that would be that would not be suitable for extreme hot conditions but unlike the adobes it can trap heat the process of making these cob bricks takes about five minutes to hand make one brick each brick is processed in such a way that it won't crack during formation and it can be tested to withstand compression gothic century 12th century Typically built with concrete that requires steel reinforcement, this takes up more space and uses extra materials to build. Concrete manufacturing has a lot of carbon emissions causing significant environmental effects. So even though these, this movement was pretty worldwide and well known, it had its downfalls that just weren't as, you know, precedent to the people in the area because it just, it was, you know, it was something new, something different. The colonial houses of the 16th century. The material for the colonial houses consisted of wood, brick, stone, and clay. Back then, many of these houses were built with wood, being that all the materials weren't easily accessible because they didn't really, they had trains and they had horses and stuff, but it wasn't like you could just say, I want this, bring it over here, I want that, I need it here by tomorrow. That just wasn't gonna happen, but these houses were still lavishly built and very nice. Minkas of the 17th century, pretty much the Japanese version of a log cabin. Built with wood and paper instead of nails, it's mud plastered and thatched roof structures. Built to be suitable for earthquakes, but in fact they did collapse. But if they did collapse, it was easy to rebuild. Box Arts, 18th century. Short-lived movement in the U.S., but praised for its symmetrical, formal design. Usually used light colored stones, in most cases was limestone. Combination of classical and Greek architecture, but eventually just became primary for museums, libraries, banks, and courthouses just because of its size, the way it looked, 
and how short of the movement it was that it just became something that you would use for, uh, you know, public use. It wasn't residential as much anymore. Shortly after was Victorian, and uh, their design was a la lavish version of the Gothic Age architecture. Mass production and mass transit made this architecture affordable because of the transportation of ornamental details and metal parts. And there's very there's many versions of Victorian style. So if you Google it, it will pull up a lot of versions. This is the generic Victorian style version, the first one that came. Lastly, the craftsmen of the 19th century. Built in the same time span, but they had different purposes. This one is more of a common man's house. It was built in the Industrial Revolution. It was made of glass, wood, and metal work formed into elegant objects. And it was meant to have a natural looking design to blend in with any landscaping. So as I said, it's more of a common man's house, still looks nice, but the idea is to encapture the nature and keep it sustainably, you know, suitable for the environment without tearing up the environment. Sustainability is at the forefront of many industries and it is impossible to talk about current or future architecture without it. Architects and designers are helping to combat climate change through industry dominating trends like utilizing recycled products rather than metal, brick, concrete, or glass. Consumers are also pushing for efficient energy saving appliances in their homes, and the entire culture behind residential homes is encouraging homeowners to make more sustainable choices. Solar roof tiles are also becoming more and more popular. Previously, homeowners have been keen on the idea of solar panels, but are put off by the physical appearance of them. In recent years, these new, attractive, cost-effective, and healthy solar roof tiles have been gaining popularity. They are discreet and do not warrant as high of an initial cost as installing panels and do not require the same amount of space. Spacious designs and open floor plans are the most sought after interior layout of the 21st century. Homeowners are hiring architects and contractors to renovate their houses, tearing down walls to create open kitchen, dining, and living spaces. Most current construction no longer features broken up rooms and closed in spaces, but rather creative layouts that warrant interaction and accessibility from all sides of the home. Another trend that has taken off in recent years is flexible spaces. One of the most popular, as displayed in the photo, is the ability to have indoor and outdoor space depending on the season. This includes things like glass garage doors that can open onto patio areas on a nice night or evening. Flexible spaces also include things like tables that can be folded up to create couches or chairs. Many of these trends directly impact the future of architecture and design, and we are entering a very cool and creative stage in residential homes. When considering the future of architecture, there are a few main trends that need to be examined. Building materials, green infrastructure and efficiency, co-living spaces, vertical cities, and lastly, smart homes. As Cameron explained in the earlier slides, building materials have changed dramatically throughout time. In recent years, studies show that building and construction accounts for 39% of our carbon footprint, concrete alone accounting for 8%. Many people are surprised by this, incorrectly thinking transportation is the largest producer of carbon dioxide. But each year, 3 billion tons of raw materials are used in construction, and since 2015, residential homes have become the single largest emitter of greenhouse gases. Projections show that by 2056, the population will have gone up by 50%, and energy consumption and manufacturing will increase threefold to support this growth. Not only are the creation of building materials a huge emitter of greenhouse gases, but over time we also have to worry about toxicity. Current materials are laden with chemicals, formaldehyde, and solvents that release volatile organic compounds over time. These VOCs create poor indoor air quality and can lead to issues like asthma. But the future looks pretty great. Many alternatives are being created, like zero carbon cement, which is exactly as it sounds, chipboards, which is wood certified for building that has been created from other wood waste, Memory steel, which is an alternative for concrete that builders are hoping will enter the market at an alarming rate, but currently the structural strength is still being tested. And lastly, cross-laminated timber, or CLT, which is made from cross sections of soft wood and not only eliminates the need for concrete in building, but also slashes the construction time by 60%. Some other pretty amazing new building technologies include wood made from recycled paper, nappy roofing, roofing, which is repurposed nappies and sanitary products by using polymers to separate the organic waste and then creating fiber-based construction materials like shingles. 
Battle bricks are also being considered as a potential home design in lower socioeconomic or disaster areas, although this is more up to the manufacturer to create the cuboidal style bottles that can be reused in construction. Fungi is a super cool naturally occurring material that also has the potential to have a massive impact in the world of architecture and design. The micellin composites within mushrooms are basically a web of filaments that will bond to the surface of waste material and act as a self-assembling glue to create building blocks. They are literally using biological growth instead of fossil fuels in manufacturing. Although they are still trying to determine exactly how to implement fungi in homes, we do know they can act as a sensor to detect changes in light, temperature, and pollutants, which will reduce production and running costs in homes. These materials are lightweight, waterproof, and recyclable. The fungi will also return to nature when the consumer is done with it. There are not many other building materials that can make that claim. Green infrastructure and efficiency are already a huge consideration in architecture and will continue dominating the industry. I will take a look at how this trend is helping to minimize harmful effects on health and the environment and the leading upcoming trends. LED, or Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design Certification, has been around for a while, but the future of LED is huge. Professional architects and general contractors with LED certified building styles are becoming more and more sought after, and homeowners are demanding environmentally conscientious homes. The LED certification is a rating system where the house gets points for its construction and performance, taking into account things like use of natural light, water reduction, building proximity to sewer and water lines, amongst many other things. By 2040, the goal is for all existing LED homes to have a net positive clean energy performance rating, which is pretty huge. Some other things you have to consider when looking at green infrastructure and design are the actual homes themselves. Prefabricated homes are grow growing in popularity. They can be relatively inexpensive because they are built off-site, delivered, and then assembled. There is less waste in the construction of prefabs because of the high accuracy of gauging materials, a shorter construction time, and less need for transportation of materials to and from the site. Cargo texture, better known as shipping container homes, provide homeowners with a limitless array of style and location. They are eco-friendly because these containers would otherwise be sitting in a shipyard for the duration of their lives and typically consider things like compostable toilets and sustainable lighting. And architects have turned them into all sorts of incredible structures, like off-the-grid cabins, apartment buildings, and even high-rises. They're also very suitable for post-disaster housing due to the quick and cheap nature of their construction. The tiny home movement has been on the rise for a while, and it is no surprise why. They are mobile, affordable, and efficient. The future of tiny homes looks great as people gear towards a more simplistic, downsized style of living. Co-living spaces are an interesting idea that is beginning to gain traction around the world in an attempt to combat the needs of a growing population. They are affordable and typically provide easy access to public transportation within cities. Co-living spaces feature shared areas for things like movies, working out, office space, and cooking. The biggest drawback to these spaces is the dormitory style feel, but builders claim these spaces will not necessarily be meant for long-term family style living, but rather month-to-month -month stays for businessmen and women and also college students who are looking to start their life in a new city. Speaking of cities, vertical cities are most definitely a thing of the future, and I'm very excited to see where they go. They have the potential <coughs> benefit there are a lot of potential benefits to these high-rise mixed-use developments. The idea is to have everything a resident could need available in one building, from parking to shops, schools, movie theaters, restaurants, anything, you name it. These high-rises also help to avert the loss of land, allowing preservation of horizontal agricultural areas. And they help to decrease air pollution and curb global warming because commuting will be vertical with more efficient transportation and less dependency on roads and CO2 emitting transportation. The biggest challenge of these vertical cities is managing severe wind. The high rises will be much larger than anything we are used to and have massive amounts of space up top that are heavily affected by the wind and can sway up to several feet. This leads to motion sickness, sleepiness, and anxiety. To combat this, designers are creating a weighted control device that will be installed at the top of the building and works with magnets to sense and combat the heavy winds. They anticipate this technology could reduce movement by up to 40%. 
Another large drawback is the expense of building these vertical cities. With the extremely high expectations for customer focus, the developer has to be willing to dump millions, maybe even billions, into the designs, construction, and maintenance of these cities. The last aspect of the future of architecture and design I would like to discuss is smart homes. We have become an incredibly well-connected society. In 2019, research showed that there are 20.4 billion connected things around the world, and 12.8 billion of those connections are within residential homes, meaning anything from your smartphone to Alexa to your security system. And by 2022, it is estimated that America will have over 63 million smart homes. There are many pros and cons to smart homes. Some of the biggest pros to smart homes are their ability to improve residents' quality of life by solving daily problems, like forgetting to turn off the lights or realizing you didn't shut the garage door. They ultimately provide cost savings as well by monitoring and reducing watering, electrical, and ventilation activity. And this leads to a lesser environmental impact because the home is less wasteful and has more controlled use of its resources. The biggest drawback to smart homes includes the initial cost of installation, especially for users trying to update a current home because there are not the necessary outlets or wiring in existing construction, making the install very difficult. The other primary complaint is the dependency on internet. If your internet connection goes out for any reason, you lose control over the system. Or if it's not a very strong internet connection, you might not be able to control the system to the extent that you want to. Smart homes are definitely the way of the future, but there are a lot of kinks that still need to be worked out.